that one up. Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you tonight. We do, yeah, man, all day. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Y'all stand with us. Power in the blood. Would you be through Calvary's time, there's wonderful power in the blood. I wish I knew the word. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, would you be free? From your burden of sin, well, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Could you glory if they don't receive? There's wonderful power in the blood. Well, let's go. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. We're going to do that last verse again. Would you? All right, now. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power.
could. If you have a prayer request, make it known by uplifting hand tonight. Amen. I want to say thank you to Brother Howard, who's working back there so diligently right now. Uh, appreciate all that uh, folks do for us. He's, Brother Howard's taking care of a leak in the bathroom. Well, I'll tell you what, we need him. Amen. Yeah, everybody, I don't know what we would do without our volunteers. Now, I know I, 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 I call him a volunteer, but I, he's worthy of his weight and gold when you got a pipe that's leaking, I'm telling you. And uh, worth it, worth, one's worthy of their hire, so whatever he charges, he's worth it. Praise the Lord. We want to thank God for Brother Howard, and I apologize for being a little late coming in taking care of a leaking pipe. But thank you, Lord, for tonight. And we pray that Brother Howard will get it fixed. And we pray that uh, things will go well tonight and that your hearts and minds will be open. Father, tonight for this word that uh, we're about to break in this place, I ask you to let it be a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let it be loaves and fishes. The, the, the word be broken and multiplied in our hearts and shed abroad. Lord, for the offering in just a few moments that will be received, Lord, we thank you for your grace being sufficient to meet every need of the house. Lord, we bring our offering and our tithe into the storehouse so there may be meat in your house. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tonight, before we go any farther, I, I want to sing one more song, and uh, this is just a little chorus. Y'all probably know this. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father. Somebody give the Lord a cheer tonight. Amen. We're going to let the youth group go back. John's ready to go back. Praise the Lord. We're going to let everybody, he's ready. He's rip roaring and ready. So we're going to let everybody go on back tonight. God bless you. Um, Sister Ashley's going to take care of the devotion for the youth group uh, tonight. We're preparing diligently for the youth revival uh, this coming Sunday. Um, we're going to need to practice with the kids uh, for just a few moments. We're going to have a meeting with the kids. Uh, um, and practice we will have to have one more practice before the the meeting and that will be it so that'll be uh, this week so praise the Lord for our young people and for our revival amen have you anybody has everybody seen the flyer for the revival have you seen it floating around didn't Stephanie do a good job yeah she did a great job I'm proud of her Brother uh, Larry, would you mind pulling out that uh, big thing for me? Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Heir of salvation 
purchase of God, born of his goodness, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Amen. Y'all forgive me. I just felt like singing. Surgery took much longer than expected, but surgery was successful, so praise the Lord. Everything was restored. All of the blood flow is restored, and they're expecting a wonderful turnaround for Brother Lloyd. Give, him a, give the Lord a cheer, please. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'll give me just a moment, I'll make sure I'm in the right place. We had a little bit of an emergency tonight, and everybody understands that can happen. Yes. Amen. 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 Yep, sisters, this, uh, I, I, my amen pew back there, Alice and Betty and Bonnie, and Uncle Jesse. Uh, I always think about Dukes of Hazard when I think about Uncle Jesse. Yeah, I'm just waiting on Brother Jesse to do a slide, hood slide, and get in the car. Amen. Amen. And so I love that family. I, it was, and I really do feel like that we've got to be related. And I mean that. And I'm not just and I do mean it in the in our biblical sense of being related as brothers and sisters. But I also mean that because Stephanie's grandmother was a crab tree. So Yep. Yeah, sister sister crab tree. They had they had Daisy Lee was Stephanie's great aunt. Lucy May, crab tree, was her grandmother and she became a king so you can't hardly throw a 
rock in Hillsboro without hitting a king or a crab tree, so we've got to be related somehow down through there. Now, that's true. Or a hamlet. That's it. And, uh, and I found out that, uh, that Brother Long down at Hillsboro uh, is related to my mother. My mother was along before she married. So Brother Long down at Hillsborough at the Pentecostal Holiness Church is related to my mother. Isn't it funny how things happen and God does marvelous things. And, and I tell you, it's a small world after all. And I'm all right with that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Praise the Lord. And we're going to start with Lazarus. Verse 19 is where we're heading next. Hallelujah. I'm past the hardest part of this chapter. The hard chapter. I mean a hard chapter. Luke, Luke, Luke 16 is a hard chapter. It is. And I'm happy to be past it. I'm not uh, past that first part. Listen, it's probably the hardest parable in the Bible is Luke 16 verses 1 through uh, 13. It's probably the hardest parable in the Bible. So let's thank God and let's not rehash it. Let's keep going. Now, if the Lord ta now watch that now. God will probably make me preach on it on Sunday, so I don't know. But anyway, uh, verse number 19. We're going to read 19 to 31, and I probably won't get through it, but I hope I do. If I don't, it's all right. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Do you notice Jesus didn't say this is a parable? Now, he did not say this is a parable. I want you to notice Anytime, the, the reason why I do not feel like this is a parable is because in parables, the um, people are usually not named. Okay? So I just want to say that. I don't feel like the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a parable. Even though we just had a parable in 16, 1 through 13. He says there's a certain um, rich man who had a steward, and he called his friends. Notice, nobody has a name. They're only called by their titles. But in this one, verse 19, it starts off the way you would assume it would be a parable. There was a certain rich man. And the reason why Jesus is doing that is he's protecting the guilty. You know, I used to watch cops a lot, especially when I was in Greensboro. I'd just go out and sit on the front porch. <laughs> Usually it was a rerun, but anyway. <laughs> Some of you, where you live in Durham or Burlington or wherever, you may be able to do the same thing. Um, or the cops may come knocking on your door. Can I use your doorbell footage? <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, uh, make it through the night my battery didn't die the microphone battery died now y'all watching at home I forget I ask you to forgive me and I forgive myself for not changing the batteries from Sunday so anyway they change the names they protect the guilty because even if you are guilty you deserve dignity okay a certain amount of dignity depending on the, and due process right and, and if, if somebody's heard their name, they, it'd be hard for them to get a fair trial. So anyway, certain amount of dignity, depending upon the crime you commit, uh, you deserve a certain amount of dignity. Now, I don't believe in um, uh, 
frankly, I don't believe in being mean to people. I believe the police don't, aren't being mean when they do their job and arrest people. I think they're just doing their job. Uh, now, there are some bad apples, but there are bad. Not every preacher's uh, out for your offering, and not every police officer is out for a ticket. All right, so let's keep reading. There was a certain rich man who was clothed with purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named what? Lazarus. So Lazarus is named, right? Why was the rich man named? Because he's going somewhere he don't want to be. Why was Lazarus named? Because he's going someplace everybody wants to be. You're going to find that out in a minute if you didn't already know. And desiring to be fed, the Bible says, excuse me, a rich man named Lazarus, which was laid at this gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Does that sound like something Jesus has said or has talked about before? Well, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Jesus tells this certain Syrophoenician woman that it's not meat to give the children's bread to dogs. And she quotes him back to him and says but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table and his heart was touched in that test to see her he didn't call her a dog he was testing her faithfulness he was testing her resolve to see her daughter he, now according to the Jews versus the Gentiles everybody who was not Jewish was a dog but frankly Jesus died for all people so he was testing her resolve. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Notice there's another person named. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes and being in torment he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, they may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tortured, tormented in the flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, likewise Lazarus' evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all of this, betwixt you and us, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence cannot, or to you cannot, Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren. They may testify unto them that at least also they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Nay, he said, Nay. Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Almost persuaded. I almost called the study almost persuaded. Which was the words of uh, Felix, almost persuaded. So, I want to look at this very quickly. Uh, Two distinct themes are discussed in verses 19 through 25, verse 26. The reversal of the values in the life to come. Was the rich man thrown into hell because he was rich? No. Was the beggar sent to heaven because he was a beggar? No. The beggar went to heaven because he was right with God. The rich man went to hell because he was not right with God. The only qualifier for heaven is to be Washed in the blood of Jesus. That's it. Two distinct themes discussed. The poor will be rewarded. Um, but when I say the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, will be rewarded. If you are a beggar and you are cursing God, you're not going to heaven. If you are a beggar and you are cursing your lifestyle as a curse unto God, then it is not a heaven-bound lifestyle. If you're a rich person and you serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, you love your neighbor as yourself, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're going to heaven. It doesn't matter about rich or poor. In this case, it just so happens that the rich man went to hell 
and the poor man went to heaven because in this case, the rich man was not right with God and the poor man was. All right, so blessed are you poor of spirit for yours is the kingdom of God. All right, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, basically is what it's saying. Many interpreters believe that this um, section of this parable to the rich man and Lazarus is a story that sparked off the life of a man named Albert Schweitzer and concluded that, that Africa was a beggar laying at Europe's doorstep, so he founded uh, the Lamborghini Hospital. There are people who are rich people who read this story and they understand that they have a duty to help those who are less fortunate than them. I get that. And that's great. But that's not the point. That's part of it. That's part of it. See, if the rich man's life had been right with God, he'd have wanted to help his brother, not because of the fact that he was fearful of hell, but because of the fact that it was the right thing to do. Does that make sense? Hell fire should not be what scares us into doing what's right, even though if it does, I'm glad it does. Hell fire and avoidance of hell fire is one thing. Doing what's right simply because it's the right thing to do is what we as Christians are called to do. Amen, Walls. But even in this situation, it appears to me that this rich man is telling Abraham, make Lazarus come and wait on me. Tell him to come dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Uh, no. Uh, now, the rich man's used to having servants. Notice the contrast. Now, I, this is where I could speak about the first parable from the last couple of weeks. Notice the contrast here of the shrewd steward and this rich man. The shrewd steward made friends with the debtors. The rich man here ignored the poor. Now I'm going to tell you something, and I really believe this. This parable, which is not really a parable, I believe that this is a real story that Jesus is seeing. Now somebody, some, I, I'm not, I don't want to be mean, and I don't want to say who it was, but it was one of my Methodist, uh, one of my Methodist brothers. One of my Methodist professors said, now, Aaron, and this was in my, I wrote about this in a paper. So now, Aaron, you, now this, Jesus could not have possibly known about a, a rich man in hell and a poor, poor man in hell. I said, what are you talking about? He graded my paper down for that. And I, and I said, if I can prove to you that Jesus knew about the things on the other side of death, will you change my grade on my paper? He said, absolutely. If you can prove it to me. I said, here it is. He's God. <laughs> yeah. I said, it's called a hypostatic union. He's 100% God, 100% man. He can see all things from all angles. He said, don't you know presently I can call a hundred legions. Back. I can call all of heaven to my side to do my bidding. I can do it at any second. But he loved you more and he loved me more. He, yes, he was in his, his, his humanity side there, but that did not stop the fact that he was 100% God and 100% man, perfectly simultaneously existing at the same time. He changed my grade. He gave me a B instead of a C. Should have gave me an A. Anyway, that was undergrad. Now I, get, now I got about a 97 average, praise the Lord. I don't know how... I told my cousin Nathan, Nathan is, uh, have y'all have met Nathan? Um, he, he's, a, he's a wonderful man of God, professor at Liberty University for the doctoral program. Praise the Lord. I heard myself. I heard myself. Praise God. I started preaching. That's right. Well, he, he could. He could pass for my brother. I got sound. I don't know why. Regina, was there saying, was, what's going on back there? Have you got? 
Okay. So anyway, Nathan is the, uh, he's a professor at Southern Wesleyan and at Liberty University, and he's a wonderful, wonderful man of God. And I said, Nathan, I don't understand how I have got a 97, 98 average. 90, well, the last class I passed was 97, so I got, uh, I got a, um, it's like a 3.85 GPA right now in my doctoral studies. I don't understand how I get the right answers. I said, all I do is read the stuff, pray, write what they ask me to write, and tell them what I think, and somehow it's the right answer. I don't understand it. I said, I'm not this smart. He said, you just haven't got the right class yet. He said, wait till you start your dissertation writing, and then they start chewing you up because you've got to be able to defend it. He said, it's not that you're not doing right or wrong. He said, it's just that they get harder as you go. I said, okay, all right, we're good. But anyway, and he was he said a lot of he said a lot of people have a, 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 a you know a ninety five plus when they come to my class and then sorry <laughs> he said I'm just hard he said I can't help it he said getting your doctorate shouldn't be easy I said well that's true anyway so well I, I don't understand how I can see that this man is still trying to get Lazarus to serve him like he's some big shot. Listen, if the ground is level at the foot of the cross, the ground's definitely level in hell. <laughs> if everybody in heaven is there because of the grace of God, then everybody that's not there is not there because they rejected the grace of God. It's, everybody's on equal footing. Hell's bad for everybody. Even the devil don't like being there. But that's his house. He can't even lock his door because Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Anyway. So it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Another person named here. How can he know? How can Jesus know? Jesus tapped into his divinity. And he looked beyond the portals of time. No, he didn't do that when he was a yes, he did. How did he know? Well, well, he should have known who touched him. Well, he knew virtue went out of him, didn't he? Who touched me? Who pulled the virtue out of me? Yeah, I believe he knew exactly who it was, but he was trying to see if she'd come forward and say it was me. He cried in torment. I think part of hell's torment, and you have to remember that hell was different then than it is now. Paradise and hell were in the center of the earth at that time. The Greeks called this the Elysian Fields and Hades, simultaneously existing side by side. They had a good understanding of it better than we do now. They, the ancient Greeks understood it better then about what it was in that time. This is also the idea of where the Catholics get purgatory from. All right? it was a, paradise was a holding place until the perfect sacrifice could be made and then they would be pulled out of paradise, and paradise is taken back into the presence of God. So, and I can prove that by the word. The Bible says Jesus went into the center of the earth, and he preached, and he took captivity captive, and he came out and brought out with him all those in the center. And when he went, the Bible says that when he died, that, that when he died, there was a great earthquake. And many that were dead, they saw them, that they rose out of their graves, and they saw them. Okay? Oh, yeah, he took the thief to paradise. He said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then the Bible says he descended to the center of the earth. So it had to be there. Now, it's not there now. No, because when Jesus came out, he brought it out with him. All right. Now, what did he tell Mary? How, now, how can, you, how can I prove that? Well, how can I prove that he took it to heaven? Well, it's easy. It's really easy. What did he tell Mary in the garden? He said, don't touch me. I have not ascended to my father yet. He had not put on his total uh, uh, priestly regalia as yet because he would not poured out his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. All right, so she thought he was the gardener. Okay? So he ascended to heaven and he poured out all his blood on the mercy seat, which he had to do to fulfill the sacrifice, and took with him all of those that were captive in the, in the center of the earth to heaven with him. All right, now he came back, and we know he did. 
We know. Well, how can you prove he did that? Because he told Thomas, put your hands in my side, put your fingers in my hand. He offered him. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, that was enough. Right. Right. He didn't hide himself anymore. Didn't have to. So think about that now. He cried. The rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now here's my question. How did the rich man know that was Father Abraham? Now we know Jesus knew who Father Abraham was. You can rest assured that Lazarus figured it out pretty quick. I think that's true, and I think that that's part of the curse of hell and the torment. He probably was. He probably. He would have been taught. He would have seen the. He would have known, and here's something else. The Bible says that when we're in heaven, we're, we, we know as we are known. All right, what does that mean? That means that I'm going to know David when I see David. I'm going to recognize him. As much as I'm going to know Jesus when I see Jesus, I'm going to know David when I, when I see David. I'm going to know Peter when I see Peter. I'm going to know Wayne when I see Wayne in heaven. And they're going to know me. They're going to know me. Well, how can that be? Well, there's a God knowledge there that is shared in that particular place, and it is given to them to know who you are. Um, now, I know when we get into heaven, we're not going to be married, given in marriage, but I'm going to know who Stephanie is. I'm going to know that she was my bride on planet Earth. I'm going to know who my children are when I get there. I'm going to know who my grandparents are when I get there. I believe it's going to save us a lot of time in the family reunion. You don't have to say, now, who are you married to? We're going, no. I believe that's part of the curse of hell, that they can see the joy of heaven. Now, we know that Abraham could see hell at that time because Abraham's talking to him. It's Abraham responding. God's not responding. Jesus is not responding. Abraham is responding to the rich man. The rich man treats Lazarus as a beggar even though he's comforted in the glory of paradise and the rich man in torment. But Abraham from paradise says, there are two reasons why no joy now can be given. First, you had all your joy on the earth and you didn't share any joy with anybody. Second, the time for pen, uh, uh, penitence has passed. Judgment is now fixed. inexorably fixed. The third act comes unexpectedly. It, you know, this guy says, I've got five brothers now. Okay, I accept my fate, but I've got five brothers. Didn't matter if he accepted it or not. It was set, judgment set, the Father had spoken, period. There's a time to die, and after this, the judgment is appointed unto men a time to die. Now, some people say, well, this couldn't have been Lazarus because Lazarus died and came back. And Lazarus was a rich man. Two different Lazarus. How many different Johns were there? How many different Marys were there? Okay. <laughs> True. It's something he's seen. He's already witnessed this. Either that or either it's already in eternity past, could be happening in eternity future, or he's watching it through the eyes of the God-man at that moment. Regardless, if he's seeing it from the past, from something he's already observed as God, who had the worst pain there of separation? 
I believe it's God had the worst pain of separation. The creation that he loved, he could not, even though they had died, could not enjoy his presence. Right, and it could be, but... And that same night, Lazarus died. There, the Bible tells us that when it comes to Jesus' personage, he had, even from his childhood, this God knowledge. And, and he astounded people. Right, he was teaching the teachers. Now, history tells us that Jesus' teacher was Paul's teacher, and they were probably classmates. Gamaliel. My Gamaliel is probably Wayne Miller. So he talks to me a lot, and he still calls me. By the way, let's pray for Wayne. Um, we're hoping to have him for a revival again this year for our, our homecoming. We're going to do the Christmas homecoming again, and I'd like to get him Sunday morning through Wednesday night. Uh, before Christmas again because evangelists don't get a Christmas bonus does that make sense okay and it's hard for him to get revivals that time of year and he's he's family so it's all right to have a family homecoming that's what I said parables do not name names typically And like I said, they changed the names to protect the guilty. And there was a certain man. There was a certain steward. There was a certain ruler. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, Jesus did say a certain, I don't think he wanted to say a certain Pharisee died and went to hell. And, they, and I don't think he wanted to say, um, uh, you, you know, uh, Jehoshaphat, the Pharisee, died and went to hell. <gasps> That's my brother. You know, you don't want to. Okay, let's get you stoned to death already, and it wasn't his time. So I agree. But as far as the rich man, I mean, as far as the poor man was in heaven, it didn't matter who knew his name. He's in heaven. And because of the fact later on, he says, send somebody to my brothers. And if Jesus had said who he was, he would have been doing the opposite of what Abraham said. I can't, I'm not going to send them to your brother. They have Moses and the prophets. But if somebody dies and rises again and comes back and tells them about this horrible place, they will not come here. He said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe one that rises from the dead. This is diving into the fact that his brothers on earth may be warned. This request hints that he himself had not been properly admonished. This is a cop-out. This is a hint that, well, I didn't know I was doing wrong. So send my brothers who are doing just like I did. Send somebody to my brothers. You'd think at first this is a, pri a cry for mercy. It's, it is, but it's a veiled cry for mercy saying, and, and, and a hopes that if, if they realize we weren't taught that, that, that helping our brother was our, oh, that's a bunch of junk. Yeah, he's calling him father. Well, father Abraham makes sense too because Abraham was the father of all, all Jews. But at the same time, it couldn't have been a Gentile. Uh, it couldn't even have been a conversion uh, uh, at that point. You're talking about, you're talking about, them. and the other thing is Lazarus, I mean, the, Fer the, the Pharisees were some of the most wealthy people in the nation anyway. So, no, they'd have thought they'd thought it's impossible for him to go there simply because he's a Pharisee, because he's kept the law all his life, and blah 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 blah. Works, exactly. So he says he argues that he will, they they would repent if someone should go from the dead. Abraham denies this request. I think it's important for us to hear this. A visitor from Sheol, a visitor from hell. Or, uh, and, and people will say, well, he's talking about Gehenna. No, he's not talking about the valley of Gehenna. I, I went to Israel uh, about five years back, six years back, 
And when I was there, my, my hotel room window looked out into the Valley of Gehenna. And you know where I was looking at? It's where the Jews call hell. Gehenna, the Valley of Gehenna is where all the refuse from the temple ran down and there was a garbage dump. And that was the closest representation to hell on earth that they could think of because I don't think any of them had seen a volcano before. Okay, so, and it stayed on fire all the time. It was body, it was a body parts that could not be used in sacrifice. People that didn't, yeah, they threw them down in there. Uh, criminal bodies, the Romans used it for criminal bodies. They throwed people in there that, I mean, some people say that's the valley of the shadow of death. I don't think so. The valley of the shadow of death is what Mary ran through on her way to see Elizabeth, by the way. So that's another tradition, and that's, I believe that. I, tip, I, I really subscribe to that. I believe it was, or subscribe to that idea. Uh, but regardless, he, Gehenna today is a beautiful valley. Today it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they were. They were trying to explain away hell. And, and really, and really, it was just a visual representation of the other place. Where the worm dies, not, even though there's fire there, there's still worms there. Isn't that weird? Why? Because there's refuse for them to land on and to grow in and flies to land on. And the worms don't die there because there's always some... Right. The blood came down from underneath the temple and it ran out through pipes that came down out and went out in that valley entrails and, and, and garbage, all kinds of this junk and refuse and, and, and sewage and all kinds of mess went down out there. And so that's the visual representation that we have of this place where this rich man is. Now, he says a visitor from Sheol, a visitor from hell would not change the selfish will of the man's brothers is what Abraham says. His brothers already knew the way of life. Or at least should have known it, could have known it, for Moses and the prophets made a class. Another reason why I think he was a Pharisee or a Sadducee, but probably a Pharisee, because they knew, and their whole family were Pharisees. If you're a Pharisee, your brother was a Pharisee, whatever. So they knew the law. They knew the stories. They knew the prophets. They knew the way of life. Mm -hmm. Right. There couldn't be, now notice, the brothers may not have, I want to say, I don't want to take this for an, ex, for an exception, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but this scripture implies what the rich man is saying is that his brothers are not living the way of life. Go warn them about this place. It sounds like, well, now they could be, but. I mean, I still warn Christian people about hell. Right. Yeah, yeah, I still warn Christian people about hell because we need to be reminded about it every now and then. And they could be living the way, but the, but the, but the implication is that they're not living the way of life. So he says, uh, uh, warn them. Brother Abraham, Father Abraham, he says, no portent could change their minds. There's no way, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe one who's risen from the dead. And Jesus is absolutely foreshadowing his own death, burial, and resurrection. Listen, I'm going to say something pretty bold here. There were people who saw Jesus resurrected and ascended who were not in the upper room. That could have been because they didn't believe one who had died and was resurrected. How stupid to see the risen Christ and to reject him. How dumb do we have to be? That is self-inflicted stupidity. Self-inflicted. You saw the man crucified. 
You saw his entrails hanging out from his body. You saw him hanging on the cross. You saw him taken down. You saw him die. You see him rise in power. You see him walk through walls. You see him appear in places out of thin air. You see him call uh, uh, to the to the shore. You can see and, and call in the fish. You see him all kinds of things that you see the man do post resurrection. You see him go to heaven. You watch him float in the air. He pulls a Superman, and you can't believe it. Self-deception. How powerful self-deception is. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Notice now, I, want to do, I do want to say a couple of things. Before his death, burial, and resurrection, during his trial, people still rejected Jesus. Herod saw him, rejected him. Pilate saw him, rejected him. Thief on the cross saw him, rejected him. Barabbas saw him, rejected him. Crowds who were crying Hosanna one minute are crying crucify him the next, rejected him. So they are... I like I like what I, I, I like what uh, Spurgeon called this casual blindness. He called it casual blindness. Casual blindness? What do you mean by that? It means I've chosen to be blind to the truth. I've chosen. Well, I don't see it. It's like when mom calls dad. Oh, dad, mom called you. Really? Dave, I know you heard me. Prove it. Can't prove it. Mama tell me, listen. I say, I am listening. She say, listen harder. I say, and I get slapped. <laughs> no, no, she won't do that. <laughs> now, even in, even in my interpreter's Bible, even my commentaries, my, the, the gentleman says this that wrote this commentary. The rich man craves a drop of water as Lazarus had once longed for crumbs of bread. The ideas of paradise and of Gehenna have practically, uh, practically coalesced uh, with the earlier idea of Sheol, a flame in one part of Hades and a spring of water on the other side. You know, and that, that's a visual representation of the difference between heaven and hell. But real hell and real heaven are characterized by the ability to feel the presence of God and the inability to feel the presence of God. Real hell will be not able, I mean, the torment's horrible. Don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying that at all. But real hell is forever being separated from feeling the love of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, God will always love us. Whether we're, David said, though I make my bed in hell, I can't escape his love. I can't. Yeah, and he, he, God is there, which is, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's there. The problem is, we can't feel him there. Forever, forever unable to connect to the love of God again on our side of things. Yes. Yes. Heaven or hell. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're going to be aware, and they're going to know you in hell. Oh, yes. All of his faculties, he has all of his faculties, his mental faculties. Yeah, it's got to be horrific. Now, think. There's only going to be relief from hell for a brief moment. 
and then it's going to get worse. The relief from hell for a brief moment is just before the second death. The relief from hell comes when everyone stands, when death and hell give up their dead and they all stand before the presence of God and for just a brief moment of time, yeah, and everything, and they're separated on the left-hand side and God says, depart from me for I never knew you and then they go from there to the worst place where hell is actually judged. Um, it's horrible. I bet these words from Abraham was like a knife going through the man's heart. Don't you remember how you had good things in life and Lazarus had nothing? Now you're wanting him to be your slave and come dip when you're in hell and he's in comfort? No, no, no. It is a, a little bit farther here. I want to go and push this a little bit farther before we stop. Luke adds this third act account of the brother's story, which is dismaying for a lot of Jews and Sadducees who are cleaving to the old covenant who were not moved by the resurrection of Jesus. The third act is logical, thoroughly consistent with the mindset of Jesus who again and again insisted that men are not changed at heart by signs or by theories, or by, uh, yeah, miracles, by, by, by pedagogical teachings. Men are not changed in their heart by enticing words of man's wisdom, if Paul was here. And even by uh, Paul raising people from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. These signs really are not what changes. Jesus even said, if you don't believe that I'm, I'm sent from the Father, believe me for the very sign's sake. But frankly, an evil generation seeks the sign. Yeah, they followed him for the benefits. Yeah. He calls them whited walls, sepulchers full of dead men's bones, refuse inside ossuaries. He calls them, anyway, he calls them all kinds of horrible things. He told them, you are of your father the devil. Um, but the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. That's the problem for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they'd put that aside. It's like this. If there is no resurrection, then this... Man is stuck in torment forever. And that did not go well with their pedagogy. It did not work well for their uh, um, ideological doctrines. It did not work well for their dogma. It didn't work well for them. And the problem is, it really don't matter whether it works well. The truth's the truth. Oh, I can, I, I, gotta, I just got to go there. I, I don't. There are some things that don't matter. When I say that, I, I want you to know what I mean. There are some things that if we disagree about, they won't keep us out of heaven. If you decide to use the non-inspired version, at, I'm not going to fall out with you that you can't go to heaven because of that. If you decide to use the King James, now if you use the message, that's not really the Bible, that's a paraphrase. And it's a mess. Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely. It's just a paraphrase. I'm going to be blunt with you. It's a, it's a good paraphrase, but take it for what it is. It's not the Bible. It's not the, the message Bible. Yes, it's not. Love your neighbors and stuff. All the law and prophets. Yeah. That's what he said. Now, here's the thing for me. There are things. That, now, if you don't, I'm not going to be mad at you. I might not listen to you as hard, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be mad at you. If you I got, and where there's confusion, there's every evil work, and that's not from God. Right? I didn't say it was the only version. Now, listen, I'm not going to go there. What I'm saying is I'm not going to be mad at anybody 
If you think that your little doggy is going to heaven, I'm not going to be mad at you. I believe there'll be pets in heaven. I believe there'll be animals there. The horses are there for sure. I believe the lamb will lay down with the lion, so we know there's animals there. Uh, yeah, ext extinct, extinct animals that have long since been wiped out because of human uh, problems and human they, They'll be there. Uh, Pegasus is there. The winged horse uh, uh, is there because we're coming back on them. Uh, you know, and you don't won't have to worry about having any animal allergies there. So you can ride your horse if you want to. Now, I would love it if my little doggy would go to heaven, but Jesus, the fact of the matter is Jesus didn't die for my dog. Jesus died for me. Amen. So, dogs may have a, a, a uh, uh, certain life and consciousness, but the soul of man is what Jesus died for. Now, we can disagree on... Think stuff like that, stuff like whether or not the carpet should be red or black or brown or pink or purple or the pew should be padded or not or the, or the air conditioner should be set on 71 or 69. I don't really care. Regina can control the air conditioning. I'm not worried about it. So those things don't bother me. But when it comes to the blood, when it comes to these things, there are things that cannot change. And I can't stand There are two genders. Two, male and female created he him. Male and female created he them. No, not Shem. Not, not, uh, I know a lot of people say that. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Well, I like to say Adam and Eve, not Adam and Evil. All right? And that's the truth. Now, I'm the problem the problem is with a lot of the Catholics the catechisms of the Catholic Church they take people's sayings as scripture that's not and so they, they deify people like Mary Mary's deified in the Catholic Church now I'm talking about Protestant believers now mostly when I say I can I won't fall out with you over little things the fact of the matter, though, if a Catholic believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, gives their heart and soul to God, and asks the blood of Jesus to be placed upon them, if they're Catholic and they really believe in Jesus, they're still going to heaven. Not if they're worshiping Mary. Like I said, if a, if a Catholic will give their heart and life to Jesus, believe in Jesus is the only way, the only truth, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, like but there's a lot of people in the Catholic Church who are deceived. And I'd say the vast majority. There's a lot of people in the there's a lot of people in the Protestant churches that think I've got my name on a roll of a of a church. I can go to heaven just because now those things I can't get with them on. Just because I pay my tithe and I'm a member of a church doesn't mean I'm ready for heaven. What means I'm ready for heaven is if the blood is applied. Those things I can't it chaps me, chaps my lips. That's called indulgences. I mean, oh yeah. Yes, sir. So the question is, if if people is the is the uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, is that for? Jews or for, uh, or for grafted Jews, which are Christians? The answer is yes. Yes and yes. It's both. People uh, are destroyed for lack of knowledge because if you don't know what's in the book, any deceiver comes along and tells you something that sounds good, like uh, you're, you, once you're in the family of God, you can never come out of it. Well, that's not true. You can take yourself out of it. Right. That's right, just like the fact that Richard Simmons never wore a headband. How many of you know that? Richard Simmons never wore a headband. He didn't say, Luke, uh, what, how did he say, Luke, I am your father? All of these things. No, he didn't. Well, you look back and these are logical fallacies. People think that these things happened and they didn't. George Washington, no, he did not. You can Google it. You can look any picture you want to look. No, I can, you can, you look at Google image search. All right, go ahead. It's an urban legend to say he wore a headband because he didn't want to mess up his hair. He had a bald spot and he didn't want to mess up his hair. Anyway, so you, you think of, and he had this poofy hair. So 
There's all of these things that people will disagree on and they'll say, preacher, I had somebody come to me and say, preacher, I want you to know, uh, I want, don't want you to feel bad about what some people say, or some people do. The Bible says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I said, where's that in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible either. No, but the, but the golden rule is do unto others. Yeah. Well, the disciples did. It was the gleaning. Yeah. That's the truth. And they left the handfuls on purpose for the poor and for the widows and the orphans. So that these things, we can, we can disagree on little things. We can disagree on little things. But when it comes to the blood, when it comes to the fact that God created us with distinct and graciousness and great, great and precious promises for both men and for women, the fact that God has designed men and women to be the way that they are, the fact that God has caused this world to be the way, it's, uh, the, the, the way it is uh, in the beginning and we warped it. If, if we, could, we, we, we can't disagree on the fact that sin is real and that sin separates us from God and still be Christian. But these people, these Pharisees and Sadducees actually had diametrically juxtaposed ideologies but when there was somebody they didn't like they would fire upon that person with both barrels and Jesus cried aloud and spared not. He called out the religious people so when he's speaking to him, and he says, when, when Abraham says this, notice that Jesus is saying, verse 14, who's he talking to? It says, the Pharisees also who were covetous heard these sayings, and they derided him, derided him. So he's talking to them. Then in chapter 17, verse 1, it says, then he said unto the disciples. He's talking to the Pharisees there. The pharisaical ways that you're doing, the religiosity, thinking that you're going to be all right simply because you check all the boxes, simply because you think you're following uh, the law and you, 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 and you miss one. No, you're guilty of it all. Yeah, the rich man. So what he's saying is the priorities are messed up. Regardless of whether or not you've got money, money can't have you. The law, and he, I'm gonna, I just want to go back to verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. All right? Jesus is saying up to John, John the Baptist, and, and John, up to John, he was the last of the prophets. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Up till now, the kingdom of heaven's been preached, and you haven't. You've heard. It's like this: you you you've, you you can't see the forest for the trees. You you you're so hung up on the the little things, you're missing the big picture. He says this in another place: you do keep the rue and the mint and tithe and all of these things, and these things you should not have left undone. But you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, the love and the grace and the and the joy and the power and these things that you've omitted. He's talking to the Pharisees, the religious crowd. We've got to be careful as a church. The church of God had slipped into some Pharisaical mess. Um, and, and there was a lot of Sadducees too because they were sad if you didn't see the way they see. And it's fair as long as you see like I see, then it's fair I see. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that think and the scribes just wrote it down and told everybody what you did, which was the gossips, which is in every church as well. So we, we really got pretty bad on taking the focus off of what really matters. What's Jesus saying here? Keep the main thing the main thing. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we'll do that, if, we'll, if we see our brother or sister in need and we close up our bowels of compassion, then where's the love of God? Where's the love of God? We can disagree on little things and make it. Again, 
I went to this, and I'm finished with this chapter, but I went to this, uh, I went to the Gate City Church of God as the pastor. It was State Street at that time because it was on State Street. They had voted to sell and move, and they couldn't sell and move and keep it State Street. So we changed the name, and then they never moved. But there were two State Street Churches of God in Western North Carolina, one in Eastern North Carolina, and we were getting each other's mail. So when we, And they had let their federal ID number uh, lapse, so I had to get all that straightened out for them. But anyway, regardless. When we went there, we'd been there. We went there in May. My first Sunday was Mother's Day that year. And we had a great, great crowd that day. And praise the Lord, God moved. We had a wonderful service. And within, Ben was two weeks old. Two weeks old. So that was in August. Middle of August. The air conditioner goes out in the parsonage with a two-week-old. The water pipes bust in the parsonage and floods the whole basement. Floods, we had to tear everything out bathroom never was fixed for the whole eight years we lived there just being blunt Stephanie can Stephanie can testify Stephanie 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 I wanted to give witness to this I'm telling the truth all right how old was Ben was Ben was was he between two months he was between two weeks and a month old when the water pipe busted at the church parsonage and the air conditioning went out the parsonage and the air conditioning units off the, the copper was stolen out of the, the ones in the church. Then the bathroom, the up the bathroom of the men's room, the up was above it. You, the, the bathroom, the men's room downstairs used to be the women's room, and the men's room was upstairs. And the ceiling was falling from the upstairs into the downstairs. No, this is the church. No, we didn't have a men's room and a women's room in the parsonage. So, <laughs> so. All of that happened within, what, seven days? Maybe, maybe two weeks to most. And I went in and I put my head on the wall. And there was at that point, at that time there was a little storage room there. I put my head on the wall, the storage room. And I didn't know Colleen Garner was in the church. She brought in, she had Garner's floor. She owned the floor. She brought in fresh flowers for the church every week. And I put my head on the wall. And I said, God, why did this happen with me? We've got a newborn, my firstborn. We had to move over to the little parsonage, at the, little, the little parsonage. Brother Bill Coble graciously allowed us to come move into his parsonage, had a second parsonage on the property. And uh, one bedroom, one bath, house with a living room. And we moved in there for several months, two months. And so I, I had my head on the wall, and I said, God, why did you let this happen? Why did this have to happen to me? And Colleen comes by and slaps me on the back. She said, that's because he knew you can handle it. And just keeps on trucking right out the back door. I said, but I didn't think I could. You know, there's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's one of these things, and I don't want to leave you with this. There's a lot of things you don't see coming. Stephanie, that, what I say was true. Okay. Okay. Um, no, but I wanted her to make sure I got the, the timeline right. It was more for me than it was for you to make sure I, because my memory's fuzzy. I've slept since those events. Uh, but we don't see some things coming. And Jesus is telling them, hell is coming if you don't stop what you're doing. These people were the religious crowd. They thought they were right with God. They thought they knew better about God than anybody else. Oh, yeah. Full of, of pride and greed and lasciviousness and all, the, all of the above. Self-centered. Self, we got to be careful not to fall in that trap, the leaven of the Pharisee. Remember, because Jesus lumps that in with the leaven of Herod as well which is pride and sinfulness. We've got to be so careful. And we've also got a warning. Jesus is giving us implicitly 
the task of telling them about him and warning our brothers and sisters that there is something else coming that's either better or worse than this life and your choice sets that stage father in the name of Jesus I love you today and I thank you for giving us your word I hope that I've been able to break the bread of life in this chapter in such a way that gives us peace and grace gives us some ideology that is in line with your mind and your heart and I believe I have Lord I felt compelled that this is one of the hardest chapters in this book it's one of the hardest chapters in the entire Bible Lord thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach it and to teach it Lord thank you because I've had to study and sharpen my own self let iron sharpen iron and my sharpen my mind and to pray through this and research this to get it in such a way that I could present it and Lord I don't know that I've done it justice but I do know that your word cannot return void and when we've read your word and we have talked about your word in this place that it has caused some good there's no doubt in my mind I don't know the end of where it'll be I don't know the the the, the end and where that, that those those words those ears that it'll fall upon down the road I don't know but I do know this Lord some of it will fall on stony ground some of it will fall on on the ground that has weeds and, and thistles and some of it will fall on good ground I pray that the vast majority falls on good ground and that their seeds planted and even though the sower throwed seed and sowed seed and throwed seed and sowed seed, Lord, even though some of it fell in places that would not be able to receive it, they stepped, they kept on, they still kept on sowing. Or let us be faithful to keep on sowing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you need prayer tonight, come and we'll pray. Otherwise, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May